All right, everybody, we are back with another episode of Wealth for the Culture. It is your host, Ollie Brady. I got my guy, Tim Jackson. First off, shout out to Andre Hatchett for connecting us, man. Appreciate you, my brother. I got my guy, Tim Jackson, on. I, I looked into it, do a little bit of everything. He, he in real estate. He a mentor. Got a, he's an author. He has a podcast, films. I, I don't know how you do it all, but we're about to get into it, man. So I appreciate you for coming on, my brother. And uh, the show, for show, man. Shout know. out to the shout out to the leader, Andre C. Hatchet, man. The connect, yes, sir. you know what I'm saying? Andre's yeah. the plug, man. Definitely is. And just do me a favor for anybody that may not know, you know, who you are. Can you just kind of break down your story and stuff like that? Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, man, it's a pleasure to be here on the platform. I appreciate the invite. I'm always looking forward to connect with new people. So. Anyone who has a platform, who follows this platform, has another podcast, feel free to hop uh, to hit me up. You can follow me on all social media at Tim Jackson. Now, uh, I would love to come and do your show. I'm actually uh, getting ready to do a tour. So I'll be in Oakland, California on August the 14th. And then the following week, I'll be in Atlanta. The week after that, I'll be in D.C. A couple of weeks after that, I'll be back in Dallas. I'm going to hit Houston. And the goal is to get somewhere to the Midwest, man, Detroit, Milwaukee, Chicago. So let's make it happen. So, but listen, first and foremost, uh, I'm a real estate broker by trade. I've been in real estate for 17 years now as a broker agent. Uh, I've retired from real estate. That's the running joke right now. I'm a retired agent now. My wife runs the business and I've transitioned into filmmaking. So shooting my first documentary. Uh, it's been really fun. I've done filmmaking in the past, like, you know, just little projects, but this is my first, you know, solo project. And so I'm doing a film. Actually had the opportunity to interview uh, Houston's own Lil Kiki, man. He's going to be in the project. And so, you know, grew up on, on, on Lil Kiki, man. You know, that's, you know, so it was it was fun to interview somebody that I actually grew up listening to. Um, and uh, so got the, got the, uh, the, the film going. Uh, I'm also, believe it or not, man, I'm also a uh, public official here in Dallas, man. I'm the sitting zoning commissioner for District 7. So, uh, you know, any type of zoning, you know, and, and planning issues go through me if it's in District 7. So that's also pretty interesting. Uh, I operate a mentoring program. It's called Real Youth Mentoring. And what we do is we teach boys between the ages of 10 and 18, uh, you know, concepts of uh, leadership, entrepreneurship, manhood. All of our boys graduate high school with a 700 plus credit score and a business plan. So we set them up for life, uh, you know, to be ready for life. Should I say, I can say set them up for life, but set them up to be ready to, to hit life and just, just go in head first, give our boys a scholarship. Our thing is, you know, I don't believe in debt and I'll, I'll conclude with my debt model, uh, you know, monologue or mantra, if you will. But so our boys, if they go to community college, we'll pay for it, you know, so when they want to go off to a big university and get into debt, we just give them a, you know, buy them a laptop or something and tell them, hey, wish you the best. But, you know, if they if they follow our route and go to a community college or a trade school, we'll pay for it because we don't believe in debt. And lastly, that's that's where I'm at, man. I, what's the language barriers on here, man? Can I cuss? Can I not cuss? Man, I wanna you, I wanna man, that's a that's for our people, man. That's free for them, man. Say what you got. I, I, I ain't gonna tear world. it up too bad, but you know, if you follow me on social media, you know, my tagline is get the fuck out of debt, right? So, you know, I, I just I, I really, really, really hate debt. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Specifically consumer debt that we use improperly, right? Debt is not a bad thing. It's when you use it the wrong way. And so I teach people how to get out of debt. That's what my tour is all about. You know, uh, I personally, uh, you know, acquired over, over the years when I came back home from the military, I got me a decent job. And, you know, I kind of fell into the trap that most people fall into. You know, you get you a job and then you go out and you get you a car, you know, you know, growing up on that. I'm going to blame you, you know, growing up on that switch of house and that, you know, that SUC, you know, when they tell us buy the car, buy the house. They told us the wrong way. You're supposed to buy the house first, then buy the car. You know what I'm saying? And so I was getting uh, getting uh, every three years man. I had a brand new car, man. I was trading in cars, getting new cars, trading in cars, getting new cars. And then I realized, like, man, I'm car poor, man. You know what I'm saying? So then I eventually bought a house. Um, but I, I used to just feel like I was stuck. Like, man, why can't I build wealth? Well, you know, I have property. I got a lot going on for myself, but I just feel like I'm car poor. And when I went through and I dove into my finances, it was that damn car and, you know, credit cards, you know. And so 
I, I actually went through a whole process where I eliminated all of my debt. And it was like playing a game. It was like, you know how kids love video games? It was like playing a video game. And uh, I got addicted to it. And so I started teaching people how to do it. And so then when me and my wife got together, um, you know, we started dating. Eventually we got engaged and married. I taught her, you know, hey, this is what I did. She actually watched me do something. She's like, man, like this, this really works. And so I combine that with the education. I teach people about credit because, you know, I don't, I'm not a fan of credit repair. If that's your thing, credit repair people, don't be in my inbox, you know, preaching to me, telling me, oh, man, I don't want to hear that shit. Like, that's your thing. That's your thing. I'm not tripping. It's just not my thing because I feel like credit repair, you don't repair something unless it's broken. You know what I'm saying? So my thing is I want to teach you how to never break it. So I, I we have an education program. Uh, and some people do need credit repair, you know, when they go through a good company. But for the most part, I would say 99 percent of people, if you, if you just follow a few certain a few concepts, you can avoid it all together and just, you know, you can learn how to use it the right way and then teach your family how to do it. So, man, that's that's me in a nutshell, man. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> That's just uh, a little bit. I didn't even say all the stuff I do. Drake gets on to me because he's like, Tim, I, you know, I, mean, I didn't hear it all. Leader, Tim. You do so much. People need to know what you're doing. And I, I, you know, I'm just, I'm getting into this whole social media presence. I got a podcast with like a, over 160 episodes, but I just don't put it out there like I should. But right now, starting now, forever, I'm putting that shit out there. So everybody. What you mean? This the plug. Hey, this is the plug right here, man. Hey, he ain't yeah. mentioned it. He an author too. Uh, oh, I ain't even throw that out. I ain't even he, throw that out. He, he got a book. I, I don't, yeah, honestly, it's crazy. Right here. It's crazy. Real dope. Across people. Yeah. Real dope. And in depth comparison between real estate and the dope game. So, you know, where I'm coming from, like, you know, the dope game was the family business. You know, like, that's what people did it where I'm coming from. They sell drugs. You know, it's been around me my entire life. And my thing was, you know what? If you can sell dope, you can sell real estate. So let me let me show you how to compare both of those um, professions, if you will, because it's only it's just logistics. And then, you know, show you, OK, if you if you can if you can do one, you can do the other. And I want to give you a lifestyle where you can live like the dope man. But you can, you know, you can pay taxes and, and not have to yeah, worry about somebody. Legit. Your yeah. All right, I got, man, I got so many, so many questions <laughs> after all the stuff you just named that you do. Let's get it, we man. Go, Let's get we it. We're just going to jump into it, man. I'm going to start off on the real estate, too. First off, for those that don't know, like, explain, because um, I, I really don't have a full grasp, like, the zoning commission, like, what, is, what does that entail? Yeah, you know, so here, so the way it works as a, as a zoning commissioner here in the city of Dallas, which is very similar to Houston, that's where you're at, right? You're in H-Town, right? I'm in Dallas, actually. I'm from Houston, though. Oh, yeah, okay. You oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm I'm up, I thought you were down in, there. Uh, I'm up in Frisco. Which oh, was, bet, uh, bet. Oh. That's where I started selling real estate at. When I first got into the game, I started selling real estate in Frisco and Little Elm. I used to sell real estate in Little Elm when, when El Dorado was the only street running through Little Elm and it was two lanes. Now it's like, yeah, it's like a metropolis out there, bro. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, so so you know uh what way it works with zoning commission. Let's just say a person uh wants to come to my district and they want to convert a piece of land from commercial uh or to residential, or they want to create, you know, convert it from residential to commercial, or they want to turn it from a, a multifamily to a single family, or et cetera, et cetera, right? There's a process that you have to go through. Let's say that you're a business and you want to sell alcohol. There's a process that you have to go through uh, that involves the community. OK. And so, you you know, the, the city has to post notices like, hey, this person is applying to have this changed. Right. And so it comes to me first. And then my my position is to one, work with the applicant and work with the community so that I can bridge the gap between the two. Because what happens so often is that people in the community feel like, that changes come and nobody knows about it. Like we wake up and, oh man, my neighborhood's being gentrified or this is happening, that's happening. But as a zoning commissioner, you know, your job really is to serve as a liaison between the applicant and the community to ensure that what's coming to the community is something that the community desires, right? Uh, case in point, you know, you're here in Dallas, so you remember the whole Botham Jean shooting, right? So, you know, a guy sitting at home in his house eating ice cream, Police officer walks into the wrong uh, house, thought it was hers. She ultimately killed him. He lost his life. You remember that case, right? Yeah. So essentially, they changed the street that he lived on, which fell in my district. 
So okay. I had to be the person that, you know, oh, essentially presented that case to the commission, uh, presented that case to the community. And that was one of the biggest cases that I've ever done because that, that made the national news. That was on CNN. That was on Fox, you know. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I was the person that they were citing and quoting when they were saying, you know, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Jackson in District 7, you know, I argued that. And I had to either argue for or against it. My stance on that particular case was that in Dallas, there's a there's a, uh, a divide like Interstate 30 essentially separates south and the north. And so the street ran through Interstate 30 at, you know, downtown and they were changing the street name south of 30. And my thing was, that, well, you're going to change the street name and you're arguing that the person that is named after is this horrible person. Then change it all the way through. Uh, so that was my stance on it. But they eventually changed it for the south. Uh, we voted on it and then it went to the city council and they made it, you know, official. So, you know, we're, we're just the liaison before it gets to the city council. We vet the process. We vet people. We vet applicants, if you will, and just present their their case to a body of people who will decide if what they're looking to do is going to be beneficial. And so it's an interesting position. A lot of people who who sit in this position, you know, they have a, a, a desire to be in politics. Uh, I don't. I've made that perfectly clear. I don't have a desire to be in politics at all. I follow politics. Uh, I'm very well versed in it, but I have no desire to be a politician. Okay. But what I do value about that position is that I, I I play a part in shaping the community, not only that I serve, but the community where I'm from, because I serve the district where I grew up. So it's it's very rewarding in that sense. Okay. And uh, what area is that district seven? What, like what what area is that like? Oh man, South Dallas, East Dallas, and a little okay. bitty small piece of Pleasant Grove. I'm from the Grove, but I grew up like, you know, District 7 is like, you know, that's where I went to school. Every school that I went to, with the exception of maybe two schools, but uh, every school that I went to fell in District 7, high school, junior high. I went to a couple of elementary schools as we moved around a little bit in, okay. in my younger days. And then, uh, man, uh, my business is in District 7. So I own and operate my real estate company. And I, I hire and, you know, employ people from District 7. So, like, this is my, this is where I'm from. I have I have the skyline of Dallas, the view of Dallas tattooed on my arm, and it's the view from District 7. Like, that's, you know, I'm, I'm Dallas, man. I'm, I'm, I'm the Grove, man. So, it's, it's really good. My wife is from South Dallas, and that's probably the bulk of it. Uh, we own property in that area uh, as well, you know, because I'm in real estate investing. So, you know, I really love this part of the city because it it, it, it made me, if you will. You know what I'm saying? Oh, gosh. Okay, for sure. Now, you took uh, this is what I want to know because you got your own brokerage, and I've only talked to one other broker. So, how did that come about? Like, how, like, because I want to kind of get into some things in the real estate game. First question I'm asking this, right? Because the real estate market crazy. I'm actually trying to look for a property. It's crazy. It's like, the market just wild. Do you think this is going to slow down or, or, or like, what, what do you think about the state of the market right now? For real it's slowing down now. You know, so so I've been in real estate so long, man. I saw the crash, the first crash back in, in 2005. Man, I was a part of that. You know what I'm saying? So it's in the market for, you know, since the first crash, you know, so oh, okay. I've seen it. I've seen it balloon. I've seen it burst. I've seen it come back. I've seen it go back down and now it's back up. And what we saw in Dallas starting in, in, the, in the last, like in May, I would, I would say in March, you know, the market just went crazy. Right after we had that freeze, uh, the market just went nuts. Like yeah. literally, you know, houses that I had on the market, they were inflated by forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, you know, in a matter of a couple of weeks. They were inflated by forty, fifty thousand dollars thousand dollars in a matter of weeks. Uh, there was no property available. Houses were selling for twenty percent more than the asking price. People were coming in paying cash. Houses were only staying on the market for a day. You would, you know, I had people, you know, if a house is on the market for two fifty, the bids were being won for three hundred, three ten. I had a client at one point pay forty thousand dollars cash uh, more for a property that he was purchasing. Right, so. It was like the wild, wild west. And now it's starting to mellow back out because at, at a certain point, there were so many people looking for a house and there was not enough inventory. So it had to mellow out a little bit. And so you had to, those people end up leasing properties, right? They had to go renew their lease or stay where they were. And so now you're starting to see the appraisals come in a little low now. It's like, all right, okay. 
you had your chance to buy this house at three hundred thousand dollars or sell this house. Now we're getting back to where it's normally at. It, we're you know it's appraising at two ninety now. It's appraising at two eighty five now. So I had two appraisals that were me and my wife were just like, man, we hope these things appraise. And one of them, the one we were concerned about the most, appraised right on the numbers at, at around three sixty five. And so, but everywhere else, they're starting to kind of taper back down. Not dramatically, but you're starting to see it low. But you know what doesn't go down? Rent. Rent never goes down. So yeah. I always tell people, <laughs> regardless of what the market looks like, rent is never going to go down. So buy. Like, get your piece of property, move into it, hold on to it, put a renter in it. Because rent will never go down, ever. It's never going down. Show me in any market where rent has gone down ever, and I'll buy you lunch. Like, it's just that simple, man. It doesn't go down. Nah, you ain't lying, because I just had to get a... I couldn't find no house, so I had to just get a... I'm moving in September. And the rent prices from when I first moved out here crazy right now. So, I think I moved over to, like, Farmer's Branch area, I think that's what it's called. So Yep, yep. When I moved to Dallas, when I moved back home, I got my first apartment in Plano. And I think I paid $520 a month for a one-bedroom, one bath, and they had a garage attached to it. And that was expensive. Like, the average apartment back, this was in 2003, 2000, let's just call it 2004. And that was an expensive apartment. All my friends were living in apartments like across the street that were like four fifty a month. But I want I needed a garage. So fast forward, I uh, let's go fast forward eight years later. I ended up back in those same apartment complexes. I went through a process where I rented out my apartment. I mean, I rented out my house and sold my car, and I was downsizing to up come up a little bit. That same apartment had went from five forty to around eight seventy. Right. Now that same apartment is rented for eleven twenty, and it hasn't grown in size. It's just a one bedroom, five hundred and twenty square foot apartment with a garage. It's eleven twenty right now. Like they're getting double what I paid when I first came back, and they haven't done anything to the inside of those apartments. They look the exact same. <laughs> when I moved back, I was like, "Damn, y'all ain't changed the carpet or nothing." You know, they just put the same style carpet down. You know, from mica, you know, countertops. I mean, it wasn't anything, no granite, no nothing. It was the same apartment that I had in 2004. And I moved back over there in 2012. It was the same apartment. I was like, man, because rent never goes down. Uh, that's a fact. I'm starting to see that now. Uh, question, do you know anything about, um, like, NACA or anything like that? You know, so... Yes and no. I was certified for NACA at one point. My guy, Andre Haynes, good guy to follow, uh, Renaissance125 on Instagram. He's like the NACA king, man. He actually teaches about NACA. Uh, he's gone through the process and bought several properties. I was certified with NACA. NACA is really based on your regional office. The regional office in Dallas, when I was certified with NACA back in 2010, I think it was, there was literally only one representative to, to hire, uh, to handle the entire metroplex. So you can imagine what that workload was like because people don't realize how big Dallas, Dallas by itself is just a big ass city, right? Yeah, it is. But Dallas Fort Worth metroplex is like, it's huge. And they had one person working the entire caseload. So the process wasn't what, you had to have a lot of patience to work that process. And for me, it just, it never panned out because my people could never like get anybody on the phone. But now I hear that the process is smoother. Um, but my guy, Andre Haynes, uh, he does a whole class on it, man. So he's probably somebody you want to get on the podcast. He actually. Uh, yeah, I heard about him. That's, that's actually what I was asking about. I just like to get people thoughts on the real estate game. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, for for zero percent down for, for what for what they're selling is definitely worth it. You know, zero percent down, you get the lowest interest rate. Uh, I just am not well versed. You know, I'm that type of guy. I don't want to, I'll never pretend like I know something. This to mm -hmm. sound like I know. I'd rather just say, man, that's not my thing. But Andre Haynes, that's his thing. So he'd be a good person to connect with. Okay. Now, for those people out there that's trying to look to buy properties, uh, can you tell them the different options they got so far as, you know, or maybe you got, you'll have a better understanding of this, like, the process for them, what they're going to go through, things they need to take into consideration, you know, because you got to worry about down payments. Then I found out you got to worry about closing costs, all these different types of things. Can you kind of just break down like what people need to be thinking about when they think, hey, I want to go buy me a house? 
Absolutely. First things first, uh, anything that you think, you know, just push it out of your mind. You know, a lot of people get online and do a bunch of research and they go to different websites and it's not really, you know, a lot of information that they're giving you is not realistic. Um, know your market. Um, don't talk to anybody that bought a house 30 years ago. You know, a lot of times people will talk to their parents or their uncles and cousins who bought a house 30 years ago or five years ago for that matter, because the market has completely changed. Get well versed on what's going on now. Try to join any Facebook groups or try to find a good agent in your in your area that's really just rocking and rolling and follow their story and follow their Instagram and just see what's going on. Know your numbers. Uh, I always tell people the reason that people fail in this process is because they come into the process with unrealistic expectations, right? Uh, you got to know the market that you're in right now. We're not in a buyer's market. We're in a seller's market. Even though the numbers are still tapering off, it's still a seller's market. So if, the, uh, if you're buying a house that's $280,000, you're not going to be able to come in and lowball and make an offer for two seventy five dollars or two seventy dollars uh, because there's other people who are going to pay two eighty five dollars and just pay the cash difference, right? And many of the people that find frustration with this process are people who don't take advice from their real estate uh, professionals or they're working with a professional who's not really well-versed on how to negotiate. So I would say get, get you with somebody. It, it, I'm not saying you don't have to get someone. I'm not saying to avoid someone who's new, but avoid someone who's educated and who knows the process and who's willing to learn with you. But, you know, if you can't trust them and you can't trust the process, then you're going to fail. Uh, have some money, you know, unless you, you're uh, looking to go through a program like NACA or you're a veteran and you have a 0% interest you know, program, I always tell my people to save about 6% of what they're going to pay. And here's how that 6% breaks down. First things first, you never pay commission, right? The sellers always pay commission, all right? I'll, I'm not going to say always. I'll say the sellers pay commission 99.9999% of the time, right? I've been in the game 17 years, and I think I've only had people pay me commission like twice. And it was just based on the way we structured their deals. But whenever a buyer takes you to a seller, that seller is paying their commission. You don't have to worry about that. So stop counting that real estate agent's money. Get out their pockets and focus on yours, right? The 6% is going to cover, one, your closing costs. You're going to have loan origination costs. You're going to need a down payment. So if you get an FHA loan, that's a 3.5% down payment off the top. If you get a conventional loan, depending on which vehicle you get in, you're going to need anywhere from 3 to 5% down, right? So that's going to help you with your down payment, especially uh, your closing costs. You're going to need escrow closing costs. So you're going to have to pay prepaids on your taxes. You're going to have to uh, pay prepaids and prorations on your insurance. Um, you, you know, there's just title policies and title fees that you're going to be, you know, going to be associated with your program. Now, if you get a, an FHA loan, which is the most common, even though it's not the most desired, it is the most common, you know, that you're going to still need about two and a half more percent from that three and a half percent that's going to make that six to help you cover those, you know, offsetting expenses. Right. Uh, but then also you'll have a little bit more money to leverage and negotiate with. Right. So if I'm buying a two hundred thousand dollar house and I save up six percent, that's twelve thousand dollars. I know that half of that's going to go towards my down payment. The other half could be a little bit, you know, towards about another percent is going to go towards my closing costs and whatnot. And then what's left over, if I'm making an offer on the house, it's $200,000, which ain't none of them here in Dallas, but I'm just using an example. Yeah, I was about to ask you. Yeah, yeah. Ain't hey, none of those in Dallas, right? But I'm just using an example. And then, I, you know, they said, well, hey, you know, we got multiple offers right now. I can slide an extra 3000 and say, all right, I'll give you 203 I don't need any, you know, closing costs. And, you know, we won't ask for any 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 minor repairs, major repairs or major repairs. You're going to... You're not going to buy a house with a bad roof, bad plumbing, bad foundation. You know, um, you're not going to buy a bad house. Anyone in their right mind would ask for them to repair that kind of stuff. But if it's just like caulking and sealing or if it's just like, oh, the doorknobs are broke. Ah, I can fix those when I move in. I can go down to a handyman, a hardware shop and pay $15 and change out the doorknobs. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't want to nickel and dime a person when they have leverage. You just want to take away their ability to to say, uh, we're not going to do that. Let's move on and say, hey, no, no, let's focus on the big stuff. And a lot of times people look at these houses as forever. There's no such thing as a forever home. The average person moves every three to five years. Like, let's just call it what it is. I I'm, I typically sell a person a house and within three to five years, they're calling me back to buy another house every single time. All of my customers, right? I had a dude that bought, sold a house in April, sold his house, bought a house, and he just called me yesterday like, hey, man, I'm ready to move. I'm like, damn, that was quick. You know what I'm saying? So 
Don't don't go into this thinking that this is my forever home. I'm going to live ha- happily ever after. The statistics say that you're not. The statistics say you won't even last 10 years. You know, if you last 10 years, you're doing something. And if you do last 10 years, you're not going to make any repairs to that house. Right. That house is going to look exactly how you bought it when you bought it. So don't go into it from an emotional standpoint. That first property is your investment. That's going to be the property that gets you to the next property. That's going to be the property that you'll be able to do. you have like any property like out of state or anything like that? Or is it just all like local? I, I personally don't own any properties out of state, but I work with a lot of people from out of state who buy properties here. And they cool with the prices right now? Because I don't know. I feel like everywhere I don't look, man, these prices, I guess to me, they're crazy. But, but you from Texas, that. though, you know, to a person in California, I just talked to somebody yesterday. I'm getting ready to go to Oakland. And mm-hmm. the average house in Oakland, California is six hundred fifty thousand dollars, and we're talking about two bedroom, one bath. Oh no, no, bedroom, I know, two. I know what you mean because I just moved here from Boston, and you talk about one story, your regular house out there, like half a mil, and I was just like, oh, right. I got to get out of so, here, man. So that's why you'll see the prices here inflating because people are migrating from those areas. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, my uncle moved in California. He sold his house for $410,000. He came to Dallas and bought a house cash for $140,000. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's okay. like, I, get you. He had, I mean, the same type of house, you know, big house, you know, three, four bedroom, 2,000 square feet, big backyard, comparable to his house in California. He was able to retire just off of selling his house in California and moving here. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, so even to sense. us, like people are like, damn, man, they charging $300,000 to live over there, you know? To us, it's crazy, but to people who are coming from out of state, it's like, man, they only charge them $300,000 to live over there. You know what I'm saying? It's all about perspective. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I get what you're saying. Nah, y'all get the fuck out of that mantra. I want to get into this. Are you on the... Cause it was, I I guess because when I first started like looking at like, that Illuminate stuff, all I would see is on, what's his name? Uh, Dave Ramsey. Are you on that? Or... You know what, man? I ain't never been one to like take shots at people and shit on people. Uh, I'll say this. Dave Ramsey is very good at what he does. Um, But Dave Ramsey's uh, approach and style doesn't translate with everyone. And there's not a lot of representation of black people within Dave Ramsey's company. Okay, I think he just fired one of his only main black dudes. And a lot of black people like feel some kind of way about that. Like whenever you're trying to learn something. You want to be able to relate to the person that's teaching you. That's why I've been so successful over the years, because I always tell people, man, I can go anywhere in my city. Right. Because people relate to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know how to have a conversation with the people downtown at City Hall. I know how to have a conversation with the trap boy. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's not like I have to go into any situation and pretend to be something I'm not. I have multiple degrees. I have a master's degree. I know how to talk business. I've operated business so I can have a conversation with somebody that operates a business. On the flip side, I'm from Pleasant Grove, so I can holler at anybody from the hood. Like, that's just who I am. It's, it's, it's what makes us unique as Black people, right? We've always had to play both sides of it because that's just who we are, right? And so, like, I respect the work that Dave Ramsey puts in. He's definitely a pioneer in the dead game. But a lot of people don't really fuck with Dave Ramsey because, you know, a lot of people don't feel like Dave Ramsey fuck with us. You know, that's the I only way you really put it. Oh, like, the- I don't know. <laughs> Oh, they rams be talking to people crazy as shit. Half the stuff that man say, like I was with it when I first. I think I read one book, and I was like, okay, it make a little sense. Like I like the whole the debt snowball thing, and, the, and yeah, the oh yeah, that makes sense. And he didn't you know? create like, okay. that, by the way. Just for the record, Dave Ramsey didn't create that. He just marketed and branded that. That's been around forever. Okay, you I'm know what I'm saying? When you that, cause... yeah, yeah, he didn't create the debt snowball. The debt snowball has been a a, a tactic to pay off debt. For by businesses forever. Dave Mark Dave Ramsey is an amazing marketer, and he's great. Like he's great at what he, I will never take away what you know how how good he is at what he does. But you know, there's a, a large dynamic of people who just won't go to a Dave Ramsey event or listen to him because Dave Ramsey doesn't really you know he's he's very very um, he's very strict on his religious beliefs, and, and and traditionally black people are very religious. But, you know, it's just the way that he goes about moving sometimes. People be like, ah, you know, I'm good. You know, like, I don't, he talks to people crazy. Like, I've been listening to his show. And I'm like, damn, he ain't talking to people crazy. Like, uh, you know. Yeah, I, don't, I can't listen to the show. I just, I seen, like, I don't know, I came across him, like, a couple of years ago. And I'm like, okay, some of this stuff cool. But half of that stuff he talking about, I'm like, I like, I guess the little person, 
I've been doing stuff so long now. I like debt to a certain extent. Like I believe. Yeah, and let me let, let me let me harp on that. So all debt isn't good, isn't bad. Like I, I say, get the fuck out of debt. I'm speaking 100% consumer debt that's unnecessary. Like sure. you know, we we as black people tend to use debt as the cherry on top and not as the cake. You understand what I'm saying? So when you think about how debt works, you know, businesses acquire debt so that they can acquire capital so that they can. Uh, make more money. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes, and so that's why when you when a business will go to the bank and say, hey, here's my business plan, and the bank will say, okay, here's some money. And then they will go and execute that plan and come back and give the bank their money. And then they will borrow more money to a certain point to where they don't need to borrow the, the bank's money anymore. Make sense? Well, yeah. consumer yeah. debt is not set up that way. We get debt for shit that depreciates, right? So for the biggest thing that we buy are cars. Well, we know that cars are going to depreciate 30% as soon as you drive it off the lot unless you're not using it from a consumer standpoint. Like you said, you know, that you're, you're into Turo. Like, that's a new concept for, for a lot of Black people, right? You know what I'm saying? So if you have a, a car specifically for Turo or using it in a rental platform, well, then that's now it becomes an asset, right? But the average person doesn't use a car as an asset. They use it as a liability. So what I teach people is, one, how to get the fuck out of debt altogether, and then, two, leverage debt to build wealth. For example... When me and my wife flip houses, we don't borrow money from a bank. Most of the times, we take that money off of a credit card. And people are like, what? You take the money off of a credit hey, card? Hey, that's, yes, sir. Hey, I just had a whole thing on that. Like, that's what I do with uh, crypto and stocks. Like I'll, Zero I'll percent interest, 18 months. You know what I'm saying? I, and I just pay, the, I just pay the, 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 the 3% fee or whatever it is to get the money. And then we take that money and then we go flip the house. Right. Yep. And you know what I'm saying? Or we take the money and then we go put into the house and do the renovations. And then we use our debt snowball that we've already acquired, you know, accumulated. And then we'll just pay it off in six or seven months with no interest. You see what I'm saying? So I, I may not have 50 grand just laying around in the bank tomorrow. Right. Or today. But I got a credit card with 50 grand on it at zero percent interest. I can pull that money off, go pay my contractors, do this, do that. And then by the time 18 months comes around, that's been paid off. You see what I'm saying? Because I've not only used the money from the sale of the property, but I've also, or if I'm holding on to the property, I use the rent and then I, I take my snowball, if you will, and I apply it towards it and I'll have that thing paid off in, in seven months. You see what I'm saying? Seven yeah, or eight do you, months. Do you, uh, do you do like hard money loans and stuff like that? No, nah, I, I personally haven't done a hard mm -hmm. money loan because for me, it's just cheaper to go put it off my car. Like I have a, okay. a couple of credit cards that have really big limits. I just got an offer yesterday from three of my credit card providers because they, they rock with me. You know, yeah. I, I pull money off all the time. I apply it and then it's they, they have their money back within six months. But it's it's not me paying them back. It's it's either the the snow uh the debt snowball or an asset paying them back. I'm not paying them back anything. Yeah. Right. And that's that's what I teach. That's what differentiates me from a Dave Ramsey, because Dave Ramsey doesn't believe that you should have any credit at all. I disagree. You know, I, I just feel like people need to know how to use credit properly. Man, I'm so glad you said that. Hey, I was trying to tell people this all the time. Like, it's ways to do it. It's just we so like, especially black people, we just so quick to we go get a credit card. We want to go get the new James. We go get you know the, the designer brands and all of this. And I'm just like, you could do so much more with that. And like, I figured it out a few years ago. Like, I could just cash, take that money off through cash app, pay a smaller cash advance than what I was getting charged at the time. I go put that money into some like stocks or something. And if you're lucky enough to get a car where it's zero percentage, like you were saying, that's free money. So now you're making money off of zero dollars. And, and, and like I said, you just pay the fee, whatever that fee is, you yep. just pay it. And a lot of people, like I said, that's that's foreign to people because they don't know how that works. But that's not foreign to me. We've been doing that. And so, you know, like but but, it, but it's all about the use of credit. It's it, it, There's there's levels to it. And a lot of people, we, we lack patience. So we want to get you know, we want to hit the home run on the first swing. No, 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 no. The, the goal, the goal is to hit, get the base hit and get the first base. Right. Yeah. So first base is getting out of debt, learning where you're making your mistakes, getting completely out of debt. Then you get the second base. Okay, now that you've gotten completely out of debt, let's reassess your debt situation and let's see how you can utilize this debt to help you build wealth by strategically making certain purchases. Third base is making those purchases 
And then, you know, setting up the assets and then getting home is when you have the assets paying for the debt. And it's just a cycle, man. Like there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, even in the rental market now, you know, I'm big on Section 8. A lot of people, oh, I don't like Section 8. I don't like Section 8. Well, during this pandemic, you know, you know who never missed rent? That that is one thing I have heard about. I, a lot of people started talking to me about that like last year, and they was like, "Well, the one the one thing they ain't got to worry about though was the rent payments." They always you know who them. never missed the rent payment. You yeah. know who never had to worry about a moratorium. Section eight, because the government's not going to stop yeah. paying you. So right? How does that how does that work with a uh, section eight? Like I, I always was wondering, like the whole process with you that. You just like, go to your local mm-hmm. section eight office in Dallas. There's over fifty municipalities. Every city has its own municipality. Then the county has a municipality. I went through the county, Dallas County Housing Authority, and I just registered with the Dallas County Housing Authority. You take their class, you become registered as a landlord, and then you you're able to take their vouchers. It's that simple. It's it's, it's not it's not you know. Well, there ain't nothing else to it, does it? No, it's not. But people make it oh, seem damn. so hard. Like you go to the county, you 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 Google your county housing authority. There's a whole packet online. They do a class for you. You register, you provide them with all the documents, which is going to essentially be your EIN, you know, your insurance coverages and shit like that. And then you fill out an application, man. You take a course. I took a a three hour course and they certified me. And then they say, all right, now you can accept our vouchers. And there's 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 not enough properties out there. They they need property owners. So then what happens is once they put someone in, you know, it's a process. They come through and do an inspection. You got to have certain locks on your doors. You know, you gotta, they got to make sure the house is livable and, and, and safe, you know, uh, shape and whatnot. Does that have to be in, like, a and, certain area? or No, it can be anywhere, man. Like, oh, it's based shit. on zip code, you know? Oh, then there's, hey, different, yeah, then a... there's different voucher types. Like, there's one okay. voucher type that there's one voucher type that, that caters exclusively to inclusive living. So, like, my house was in a subdivision with an HOA. You understand what I'm saying? And the lady who rented my house was, like, a lady who had, she hurt her back and she couldn't work. But she, you know, she drove a BMW. You know what I'm saying? Like, she was just an older lady who worked in corporate for a long time, and she couldn't work. Like, she's not a bad person. Nobody on Section 8 is a bad person. People just have different situations, right? Yeah. And so she took care of the house better than me. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. So this whole, this whole bit, that. oh, they're going to tear my house up. When people say that shit, I'm like, you've never done Section 8 before. I already know. Whenever I start hearing people talk that Section 8 shit, I'm like, you've never used the program. You know how hard it is to get on Section 8 now? And, like, nobody ain't trying to lose their voucher. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you rec- yeah. if you report a person for tearing up your house, they can get in trouble for that. They can lose their voucher. Okay. So you just got to know how to leverage it. And then the rent goes up every year. Like, you just apply for an increase based on inflation. Like, it's a, it's the, it's a lick, you know? And in times like this where there's a pandemic where people can't work and then people aren't paying their rents, my friends that are landlords that had traditional tenants, they were, some of them haven't had gotten rent in 18 months. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about because a lot of people talk about that's like guarantee. Like, that's what I've been hearing because I, like, I just started really looking at it. And I'm like, <laughs> it's guaranteed. And, and that's what I'm saying. Guaranteed, got me. I was, man. I like, they, know, that money come that every stuff. month on the second. Every month, man. Like, the, the first two months, you don't get a payment because they have to put you in the system. So, like, you don't get no payment the first month. Then it's like the second month. You you get you get your next payment the second month and they'll give you everything. So like you know don't anticipate a payment for two months, but when that payment comes in, man, that's that's like clockwork. Man, that's like a, hey, I'll take that though, shit. And it's based Damn. on zip code, so they pay you based on your zip code and the number of rooms you have. That's it. That's it. Okay. So if I'm in seven five two two seven and I have a three bedroom, they're gonna pay me twelve hundred dollars. If I'm in seven five, you know. Two one four, they may pay me, you know, eleven hundred. If I'm in seven five, if I go up the Plano with it, they're gonna pay me fifteen hundred. It's all is based on the zip code and uh and, and bedrooms. Is it? Oh man, you should have never told me that. I didn't know. It was, I didn't know. I thought it was way more to it than that, man. Oh, man, no, it's not. Now you mentioned you got to a <laughs> master's and all this though, because this everybody that come out here that got a degree, I got to ask because I got I got I got my degree and I got my MBA, but I still got my thoughts on college and stuff like that. What's your thoughts on college? Yeah, college is the biggest lick in the world, man. Like uh, I tell people that you know it's the biggest lick. You know, it used to be a time where you needed. I remember when I was in the job market heavy. You know, when I came home from the military, two thousand three, two thousand four. You know, every application was like, you need a bachelor's degree. You need a bachelor's degree. Like, the bachelor's yeah. degree used to be, like, the golden stamp, right? 
And so if you didn't have a bachelor's degree, you, you just got entry level positions. Right. So the, the thing was bachelor. So I got into an entry level position based on my work experience with the military and I worked my way up and I never got a degree, but I always ended up in management. So then I noticed like the shift started happening around 2012, 2013, where the executive MBA became really popular. So now even all the people that was going to school getting bachelor's degrees were finding themselves not be able to be employed yeah. at the highest level. Now they're getting entry level jobs too because the executive MBA was the thing. And it's like, I mean, the degrees, you know, they lost their weight when black people started getting them. I always say that, man, when you start seeing a whole bunch of black people getting degrees, that's when they start not being worth anything because a degree for so long has been used to discriminate. Yeah, you know, I don't care what anybody says, man. I'm that guy. So if you if you feel some kind of way about yeah. it, that's on you, right? I, I firmly believe whenever black people start getting into stuff, like even with cryptocurrency, so now you know they're they're really trying to regulate this cryptocurrency, man. Right, a lot yeah, of, a lot, of, man. A lot sure. of wealth has been created, right? I think there was something like five million uh, people being million made billionaires in a month. Yeah. Man. It, so it's crazy. So like you know I. I I teach my boys, if you're going to go to college, go to the community college route, pay as little as you can, and then find programs that will get you up to the, the bachelor's route um, to where you don't have any debt when you get out. But I mean, none of, all of my degrees I got after the fact, and I don't use any of my degrees. I tried to use my master's degree, but, you know, nobody would hire me because, you know, I can only thing I can do with my master's degree really is teaching the college level. Right. And so, you know. That's really kind of a game within itself. Like you got to know somebody who knows somebody to get in at those colleges. So, you know, it's good on my resume, but I mean, it's good for having conversations and shit. But then those degrees don't really be worth shit. Unless you're an engineer or an attorney or a nurse, when you're in something that requires like specialized training, it's just it's just a, a piece of paper. Yeah, man, we're also happy you said that shit because I try to tell people because I like not. I don't know. Now that I'm older and I know certain things the way they work, and I got my MBA and stuff, I'm just like, this didn't help. Like, cause I do, I'm in management at a military defense contractor, and honestly, they don't care about them. They don't care about the degree. I mean, yeah, you need a bachelor's, like, but that's just like the standard. Like, oh, they trying to crack down and make it look more legit. But the MBA it just says like, that you you have discipline. That's all. Yeah. Like, if you can go about making money, man, without having to go get in to the, especially the debt you're gonna get in. At college, man. That's why I'm glad you was preaching on uh, community college, even trade schools, because it's Absolute like nobody nobody school. think about that at all. Seems like nowadays, I'm just like that's a whole bag, right? Especially right now, because nobody wants to do it anymore. Plumbers make more money than nurses, man. Like you know, what I'm saying like it man, just is what it is. It's a fact. Them, electricians, all of that, like electricians are making more money than nurses, and and like. Man, it's a fact, it. and that's not the shit. I, you know, like nursing, we need nurses. Like, let's not get it twisted. Yeah, sure. You know, but even the nurses are now learning how to go back and get certain certificates so they can be practitioners. You see what I'm saying? Like, and that essentially is a trade if you think about it. Like that, adding that practitioner to your name. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, so you just got to know how to finesse the game, man. Like, anyone who can build anything right now is winning. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're a general contractor and you have connections to builders, people that can do work, hard labor, you're winning right now. You know what I'm saying? That's why houses are up so much because there's no one to build them. Bad in lumber, but like try try find a handyman right now. Like that shit is almost impossible to find somebody consistent. Oh uh, yeah, that's how. Man, you, hey, you preach right now, man. I ain't gonna lie. Let's, <laughs> nah, nah, that we kind of hit on that. I wanna. Like, just can you break down, because you mentioned that you do mentoring. Can you just kind of break down what all goes into your mentoring program? Sure, sure, sure. So with us, you know, we we just we focus on the ages of 10 to 18 because we feel like that's the impact that we can have, um, you know, the most impact. But we teach our boys about entrepreneurship. Uh, we teach boys from the ages of uh, 10 to 18. Um, but main thing we focus on is manhood. Like, you know, what's a man? We we. We surround them with a lot of different types of men, right? So you have your entrepreneurs, you have your corporate types, you have, you know, your military people, people that come from all walks of life. Because one thing within the black community is that, you know, when you start talking about manhood, there's only like three prototypes. Like you need to go rap, you need to go play a sport, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. uh, or, you know, you need to be on some other shit, right? And so, like, we want to give them an example of what a real man looks like. From different aspects right you don't have to fit a mold you can be a man 
principles of manhood are more based on responsibility, man, economics, like knowing how to control your pockets, knowing how to control, you know, and master some of your desires, knowing when to speak, when not to speak, like knowing how to walk into a room and to command the room, but not stand out too much to where, you know, people want to put a target on your back, like leadership, just, just principles of manhood, right? Um, we teach economics and finances. We teach our boys everything that I teach about getting out of debt, keeping your credit score right, uh, owning property, owning businesses, um, you know, giving back to your community, being an asset to your community, not to leave your community, which is a taboo subject because I understand that, you know, a lot of communities where black people are, uh, aren't the best by design because they've, they've run, you know, highways through our communities. They've taken the resources and the assets out of our communities. They won't put jobs in our communities. So let's not get it twisted. We're not going to shit on black communities as if black people have caused the problem. Most of the black communities around the nation were some of the most thriving communities in the nation until, you know, people start coming and taking things away from it. So I'm not going to be that guy. Uh, but what I mean is that, you know, a lot of times, you know, we leave our communities and we don't come back, but then we complain about gentrification and we complain about the, the systemic issues. And my thing is, well, go back. You know what I'm saying? Like I, when I came back from the military, I moved to Plano because I thought that's where people with money lived and that's where, you know, uh, survival was. And then I realized real quick out of Plano, I was just, you know, another black man getting pulled over, here, <laughs> you know, every six months, you know, and getting my rights violated by getting illegally searched, you know, and shit like that. So I was like, well, I might as well just come back to Dallas, you know, and I came back home and started my business here and, you know, came to my community. And I'm not saying that, you know, a person has to move back to their hood, but be invested, like buy property where you're from. Like the first piece of property that I flipped and bought was literally in the in one of the neighborhoods where I went to school and I grew up at, right? My wife, same thing, right? So go back and invest in your community and, and put money into it. Um, you know, and, and we sold that property to another young couple who was from the community. See what I'm saying? Like, that's how you, yeah. you, re, you know, redistribute that wealth. Um, and just be, you know, if you don't live there, just at least go back, like go back and contribute. You know what I'm saying? Find a program like me. I volunteered at a school right down the street from my office. I did it every year for every, every Monday for two years, you know, just went up there consistently every Monday, sat down with a group of about 10 or 15 boys. And just taught them business, like taught them the game, right? So that's what the mentoring program is about. You know, we give out a scholarship when you graduate high school. Uh, we, we started taking our boys on trips. We went to Memphis, Atlanta, and Birmingham, Alabama two years ago. We were supposed to go to D.C. last year, but of course, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, and we didn't really know what that looked like from a travel standpoint logistically, so we didn't go. We didn't go this year because things were still kind of where they are, but our goal is to take them out next year, so... Um, yeah, man. And that's, that's just who we are, man. You know, we, you know, we don't, we don't be standing on the corner selling bottles of water and shit. You know, we, uh, you know, we teach them how to, you know, make money, you know, teach them how to start online businesses, teach them how to, to, you know, about e-commerce and things like that, like smart money, you know? So you know, we just, we just building a new, a new wave of, of, of men that's going to be running it for us, man. This is our future. So, you know, hold on real quick. Let's talk. All right, man, but no, nah, that's definitely dope. It's definitely good to see, especially black people out here trying to give back. Cause a lot of us, like myself, cool, like I ain't have my father really going up like that. So just to be able to see someone, like I saw my mentors and stuff like that through football, but a lot of people don't have that opportunity to be able to see, you know, certain figures like that out there doing something other than what you mentioned, like, you know, playing ball or something like that. So it's good to be able to get somebody that's going to pour back into you and teach you just like about life. That's to me what a lot of people don't get. Like I didn't get that. I had to figure that out just because I was online and, and on YouTube and stuff looking. So that that's important to me, man. I, I'm glad you know people out here doing that, giving back to the community and putting people on, man, and not just putting them on an aspect of saying, "Oh, you need to go pick up a ball, you need to go rap or do something like that." But nah, you can go do this a, a more legit way, running a business. Getting into this, you know, even if you want to go do a trade or go to school, it's a smarter route to go to get that degree. It's a it's a means to make you know a good living doing trades, and that's what I'm glad that people like you out here doing, man. So I just want to salute you, applaud you, man, and tell you appreciate everything you out here doing for the community, man, especially the black community because we need that. Absolutely, my man. I mean, I appreciate everything. I really do. Now I got one last segment. All right, man, let's help. All right, man. But yeah, like I say, man, I just want to 
you know, thank you first off for coming on, man, especially on some short notice. Like, I, I hit this man up. He was like, cool, let's run it. So I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, my brother. I got one last segment. Yes, sir. It's a, talk, it's a talk to the culture segment. I just run on five questions. So first question is, what does wealth look like to you? Oh, man, what does wealth look like to me? Wealth looks like being able to wake up in the morning and not have to do shit if I don't have to. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know, there's been times where I've woken up in the morning and I told my wife, man, let's go to Vegas today, you know. Uh, wealth is wealth is rich is flashy. Wealth is quiet. You know, yeah. you know, people need to understand that wealth is quiet. You don't have to. People don't have to know everything you have. And that's one of the reasons why I feel like I struggle on social media, because I don't show my money. I've never been a guy to ever show my money where I'm from. You just don't show your money, you know, because people will rob your ass. You know what no, I know what you're talking about. Like it just yeah. took me to last year to start getting more. People keep saying you gotta show, like you gotta show something. Yeah, yeah. So I show what I, I show what I want to show, but like uh, you know, a lot of guys, and I'm not shitting on nobody. Like I understand with black people, man. Black people have to be tricked into wealth. Like you know, there'll be a person that has like one of the richest guys I know. He owns over a hundred properties. I mean, this guy has been driving the same '98 Lexus since I met him back in 2002, and I'll never forget seeing him at the cleaners one day in Plano. And he was like, hey, what's up, Tim? We hadn't seen each other come. He just said, ah, I see you got a new car. You know, and it was kind of like he was throwing shade at me, you know? Like, you know, he owns over 100 properties, and he's driving the same car. And I, at the time, I ain't had shit, and I was in a brand new car. You understand? Like, well, rich is flashy, wealth is quiet. Like, this dude could buy a fleet of my cars, but, you know, he chose to go, you know, the real estate route and to be quiet with his money, you know? Uh, doesn't dress up. Every time you see him, he got the same shit on. Like, I'm finding myself wearing the same shit now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because it's just like, I mean, I ain't trying to impress nobody because my goal is to get get more wealth. So wealth is quiet, man. Like, um, and I don't knock anybody that goes out and get like, you know, I have, I know people that drive really nice cars. My God, like some of the best cars you've ever seen. But, you know, when you start pulling back the layers of their portfolio and stuff like that, they don't really own much. You know what I'm saying? And so wealth is ownership, you know, like, what do you own? What can I pass down? What tangibly can I give to my son and to the next generation? So that's, that's, that's what I see wealth as. Okay. And next question. I always just get a book recommendation for everybody on here. Real dope. <laughs> yes, sir. Plug in depth comparison between real estate and the dope game. My book. I would, if you're looking to get into real estate and you just want to learn what real estate is from a fun perspective, and, you know, have it broken down to, to what I call layman's terms. Get the book. It's fun. It's a quick read. You'll enjoy it. It's going to open up your mind to different possibilities. I talk about Section 8 in there, too. So real dope. An in-depth comparison between real estate and dope. And you can go to Amazon. It's on Amazon Prime. You can have that mug tomorrow if you order by 12 o'clock. <laughs> hey, in line. Hey, well, next question is, what's one thing you think the black community needs to improve on? Um, I think that we need to improve on acting more as a group, right? You know, I've been watching this, and I I, I don't care who I piss off, man. People can get upset with me. You learn that about me, man. I don't I don't care who I piss no, off. No, for sure, go ahead. Um, you know, I look at this whole situation going on with the baby, right? And I just think it's interesting because you know whether you agree with what he said or you didn't, um. Everyone's just ready to counsel him, right? And when you see the people that are leading the charge, it's black people that's leading the charge, speaking out for other groups. Like, like uh, I wish that we would come together for each other to defend each other as much as we come together to tear each other down. Like, yeah, for sure. you know, people people will come together to shit on another black person. So it's like shitting on other black people is a currency within white society. And a lot of people know, like, that's why I'm not on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is like, are you on LinkedIn? I got one. I don't, I don't use it. I, I just, I can't get on. I, if you want to go see a bunch of shucking and jiving and a bunch of black folks begging for a job and shitting on black people to make themselves look good in front of white people, man, LinkedIn is the place to be, man. I've never seen so much cooning in my life. Like, at some point in the game, you're going to realize that you're disposable to them, man. Like, 
You know, a lot of people, and this isn't a black versus white thing. This is just like, I, my, I know white people that say, Tim, you know, the reason I respect you is because you, you, you don't give a damn. Like you, you stand up for what you believe in. You know what I'm saying? Like if you, you feel like white people are doing some sucker shit, you'll call it out. You know what I'm saying? I've always been that dude, right? Because right is right, wrong is wrong. But what happens too often is that punishment is always inflicted on black people. I was watching a news article. This lady, a white news anchor, was, was doing a story with a black guy. And it was at the zoo. And it, they showed a monkey on the screen. And she told the black dude, this monkey, he kind of looks like you, huh? <laughs> and uh, uh, the guy just kind of, he played it off. And then the next day she did this heartfelt apology where she was crying and shit and everybody forgave her and no one ever heard anything about it. Right. Yeah. And it's like, okay, the baby issued an apology. Like, let's move on. Like he was wrong. It's a teachable moment. Let's move on. Um, same thing with Kevin Hart when he had the, you know, when he was supposed to host the Oscars, they went back and found jokes from back in 2011. He had apologized for several times. Like let's move on. Like yeah. the guy made a mistake. He apologized. But see, with us, we punish. We we. It's like we want to see other black people get a death sentence when they make the mistake, right? Like we got to get out of that. Like we have to start learning how to say, "All right, let's pull this person to the side. Let's let's extend this discipline. Whatever we need to behind closed doors." But when we get in front of folks, we gonna hold it down. And be like, "Hey, he made a mistake." Like when them kids, went, when them cats went to the Olympics in Brazil, them, them swimmers, and they were out yeah. there getting into fights, and then they said somebody robbed them. You remember that? Oh, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. And they made up a whole story that yep. said somebody robbed them and that didn't happen. These were 30-year-old peak Olympians. These cats, was, a couple of cats were 30. But the, the internet, you know, the media called them kids. Like, they they knew they was wrong, but they they backed them up. It was like, hey, this is our problem. They good. They made a mistake. Keep it moving. They didn't lose no endorsements. They didn't lose the ability to make a dollar. Like, white folks don't do that to their own people. They, they stay on code. Hey, <laughs> like yeah, hey, so, you ain't lying though. That is a big thing out here, man. Black people I, gotta learn how to stay on cold and stop trying to shuck and jive for these butter biscuits, as Tariq Nashibi said, man. <laughs> like, like you know, you know, they, you, these folks don't respect you, man. Like they're not gonna respect you because they know that you'll sell out your own people to get close to them. You know what I'm saying? So I just wish that we as a as a as a community would stop, you know. Uh, making examples out of our own like stop talking about black on black crime crime is, is crime you know white people kill each other at 95 percent race black people kill each other at 97 six percent race asian people kill each other at 95 percent race like people kill the people crime is committed in proximity not based on color you're more likely to commit a crime against someone you're close to not someone that that you're not close to so i'm not gonna hop in a car and drive all the way to frisco to rob somebody i'm probably gonna rob somebody over here Oh, yeah, and sure. not times I see they're going to look like me. Does that make sense? Yeah. But whenever it's time to have a conversation about improving the black communities, like, what about black on black crime? Bruh. No, no. We're trying to get some tangibles for our people. Like, stop bring, stop using them talking points that's going to essentially set us back. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just wish that we would learn how to stay on code. That's it. You know? Oh, sure. Like, when people within our community do something they ain't got no business doing, you know, that's house business. Like, let's handle it in-house. And then we get in front of the camera, we're going we gonna, to, hey, everything's taken care of. He made a mistake. You know, we'll ensure that it never happens again, you know, and then we'll keep it moving because other people don't think like that, man. Like they just, they don't do it. We don't the people that don't do it. So I wish that's something that we can approve on. Hey, just, just drop the whole <laughs> bar. And, and I ain't going to do the whole spill, but hey, I, all I know is you ain't lying. I'm going to put it like that. That's just straight facts right there. Uh, I'm not counseling the baby, man. Like so, so hypothetically, these people are putting out these statements that they they are talking about diversion and inclusion, but you're having a festival with tens of thousands of people with no mask in one condensed area during a global pandemic, and you care about people, and then the people up there they're rapping uh, about killing people, and yeah, yeah. you know, so he so he get up there, thing. yep, yeah, you can he can get up there and rap about killing n words, and he can get up there and rap about. All this stuff, but if he makes an off-color comment about one particular group, um, then all of a sudden he can't earn a dollar anymore. Like, come on, man! So it's okay for him to kill me. <laughs> he can kill me in every song. Right? Yeah, that's, been, that's been the thing. Like, and, that, and they and they cool with that too. And that, but that's that fake outrage. And then black people, you know what? He, you're right. He showed 
Like, get off of that, man. Like, understand the game that's being played, man. Like, dude made a mistake. He said something that he probably should have said. And I hear DJs say that all the time. Every club I go to, every club I go to, I hear DJs say that. So they're going to make an example out of them, just like they make an example out of all black people. Anytime this time to enforce something, it will be enforced with black people every single time. And black people need to understand that that's a part of the game. So stop, stop playing into it. Nah, but that's a fact because we done seen, I ain't going to tell you, we done seen it with like white artists even, you know, Justin Bieber had the whole song where he was harmonizing the N-word. And ain't one one said less nothing. lonely N-word. One less lonely N-word. And you know, and like he made a whole nothing. song. You know? You know? Uh, that's crazy. We Don crazy. Just, and we okay with that. We'll just be like, you know, they'll give an apology and we'll just look at it like, all right, whatever. I'm cool now. We'll forgive other people, but we crucify our own people. We got to get out of it. That's my one thing. Okay. Now, I got another question after this one, but what's next for you, man? I always like to see, like, what's next for you? Well, working on the documentary now, man. Hopefully the documentary will be done by November, December for release date of March. Um, and I'm going to pour everything I have into that documentary, man. So, uh, you know, filmmaking is where I want to transition to, start telling the stories of people that aren't being told. I think when you watch TV, you know, if, if you watch BET right now, which is not a black owned company, BET has like five TV shows. Like, that's it. Just go through, click on your TV and just click on BET and just scroll through their program. And they got the Martin, they got Fresh Prince, they got everything that Tyler Perry puts out. And then you'll see a movie or two. But like, literally, that's all you see on BET now. Right. Like anything that you have on television that's dealing with black people is just all a bunch of stereotypical shit that. It just, you know, and I like Martin. Let's not get it twisted. But, you know, at some point in the game, we're going to have to start putting out stuff that empowers black people and shows a true story. Because black men specifically are under attack. Like we are just like being made to face the bane of society. Like, you know, everything that's wrong has something to do with black men. And sadly, our women are perpetuating that narrative. And they're going to see really quickly as they're seen now with, you know, the tracks, you know, with Simone Biles and the girl Shikari in track. They're going to attack. Eventually, they're going to start attacking black women like they do black men. Right. Like that's just the game. You know what I'm saying? So we need to create more content that shows black people in a in a in a realistic setting. Right. Because the average black person doesn't play a sport or rap or, you know, they're not an entertainer. We're hardworking people who live in our communities, who take care of our communities. Black fathers are more engaged and more involved with their children than any other race of people. Any yeah, that's they'll, statistically they'll proven, man. They'll definitely make you make it look like we just you that's know that's statistically proven, right? Yeah. So let's start telling those stories. Like, and that's what I want to focus on. I'm glad you mentioned that because we another thing we ain't mentioned, you out here with documentaries, man. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. You said you're doing a little kiki, man. I'm, I'm definitely gonna be tapped in for that one. This, this, this one I got coming out, man, it's gonna be a game changer. It's gonna I'm gonna come, I'm gonna bust into this market, and people are gonna be like, Oh man, where this guy been? It's going to happen. Sure. We all going to be tapped in, man. But I just want to thank you for coming through, man. Do me one last favor, though. Tell people where they can find you at, man. Social media. Absolutely. Whatever. Hey, you can find me on all social media outlets at Tim Jackson now. Just how it sounds. T-I-M-J-A-C-K-S-O-N-N-O-W. I'm new to Instagram and Twitter. I, I only got I only think I got 100 followers on Twitter yet. I'm going to have a million before it's all over. But if you guys are listening to this, man, go follow me. Uh, there's a message that I'm putting out that everyone needs to hear, that people know about, but ain't nobody really talking about it. So we're going we gonna to attack some things from a different perspective. Uh, I always tell people, man, I'm the most relatable person that you'll ever meet. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, the stuff that I talk about, I've actually done it. I'm not on here just telling you something to sell you a course or telling you what you need to do because it sounds good. It's something that I always that I've actually done. If you hear me say it out of my mouth, I've done it. I always tell people I'm the realest guy you never met. Right. Like it's so many people out there that can give you so much game, but you have never met them because, you know, they're not the people that's being pushed in front of you. Anytime you see somebody being pushed in front of us, they've already been vetted. And nine times out of ten, they're going to do something that's going to go against the interest collectively of our people. Right. You need to start getting into these these pockets of people that aren't being pushed up to the highest level, you know, eventually cream is going to always rise to the top. And that's why I'm getting so much traction so much faster, but you know, come follow me at Tim Jackson. Now let's have a conversation about getting the fuck out of debt. Let's have a conversation about you owning real estate. 
Let's have a conversation about you diversifying your portfolio, but more importantly, let's have a conversation about you being a better person in your community. Yes, sir. We're going to have all that in the show notes, people. So I appreciate y'all for tapping in. Appreciate you, my brother, for coming through, dropping game. And, and you got a whole lot going on, so I'm definitely going to be tapped in. And I know you're a Dallas, so I've definitely got the link with you, brother, offline. Show Absolutely, me. man. And like we always say, man, on the show, what good is success if everybody around you is still struggling? So each one, reach one, each one, teach one, man. And we are out. <laughs>